Reality. Is it naturally occurring or mechanically created? An astrophysicist squares off with a computer scientist. Ahead on Science Goes to the Movies. Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Faith Saley, and I'm delighted to be joined by Ken Perlin and Matthew O'Dowd. Hello, gentlemen. Thank you for being Hi, here. Faith. Hello, Thank you. you for wearing your tie with constellations. Oh, of course, just so I know where I am at any time in the <laughs> Okay, good. I would have worn my computer science tie, but it is it, is it, it's it's is it as colorful? It yeah, it's doesn't virtual. Doesn't shirt. You know, yeah, there you go. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Professor Perlin is the founding director of the Media Research Lab at NYU and the director of the Games for Learning Institute. Professor O'Dowd is a CUNY astrophysicist and host of the very popular PBS series Space Time. Now, you may be wondering what movie science falls into the overlap in a discussion between a computer scientist and an astrophysicist, and the answer is reality specifically alternate realities. Matthew is going to represent alternate realities that fit into a naturally occurring multiverse like Narnia or the man in the high castle. And Ken is going to tell us all about the man-made computer generated alternate realities like the Matrix or Ready Player One. Okay, Matt, let's, let's start with the idea of Narnia or the magicians or Coraline or Demonata, mm -hmm. the list goes on. What are the chances that there's a pocket universe stuffed beyond the back wall of my closet? Well, I have to say, first, I was one of those kids who was tapping on the backs of closets for months after finishing The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Were you really? And not that young a kid either. <laughs> mm. uh, so I guess that makes me all the more sad to have to say that the alternate universes, the multiverses that might actually exist as far as physics understands, are not so accessible, but they might exist. And this is kind of a crazy speculation, but it might be true that there are infinite observable universes out there. And um, the, the crazy thing about having infi an infinite universe is that you should expect every single possible configuration of matter to exist out there somewhere. So every arrangement of atoms in all permutations, which means this world is repeated perhaps infinite times and every single imaginable variation of this world this universe is out there somewhere and so that's that's one example of so is that one theory i mean is is it can i even ask the question if a multiverse exists what does it look like uh i mean please I can just jump tell in. me this you, they'll be talking animals and functional magic okay. yes in, at least some of them, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Not well, all. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that in in this, perhaps slightly sadder version of the multiverse, that's mm -hmm. just going really far and finding all versions of the universe that you might find. You're still constrained by physical laws. So all possible universes based on well, the they, laws they of physics. They don't have to be the same laws of physics. Like you know, those 19 fundamental constants might change something. There might be some slightly we don't know there are there there are there are cool ways to do that mm. it's true have you ever heard of uh eternal inflation whoa no i think that's a term they used to use in politics yeah, yeah exactly well there's there's a, a a physics eternal inflation so it's it's thought that in a tiny fraction of a second after the big bang the universe uh accelerated in its expansion exponentially and this is kind of well accepted nowadays but a slightly less well accepted but possible idea is that actually the the uh, default multiverse is this crazy eternally expanding you know space time um, and our universe is just a little bubble that that kind of nucleated out of that infl inflation and started the the slow stately expansion. So there could be other bubbles. Exactly and those other bubbles might have different fundamental constants, different right. physics which might look like magic to us if we could visit them. Right. If our elementary particles didn't explode immediately. Right. And outside of maybe a Philip Pullman novel, you can't get to them. Yeah. As far as we know, n no. No. All right, Ken. Now you. Okay. 
Steven Spielberg is currently shooting an adaptation of Ernest Cline's novel Ready Player One. Borrowing from William Gibson, the film takes place in a future where most of life happens on the internet and physical reality has lost most of its importance. And in real life, with virtual reality and augmented reality and the HoloLens, the world of Ready Player One does not seem far away. So can how close are we to implanted wetware in our bodies for a straight in jack to living on the internet? Implanted wetware for a straight in jack. No, that was like right out of like uh, cool. It was out of, out of free jack. <laughs> so with, so I'm anyway. not that cool. So let's, let's break it down. What is uh, So basically there's this progression um, in any technology. Technology does tend to gradually move into us. So if you look at the early industrial age, we would build these giant things around us. And then, of course, at some point, you know, within the last 10 decades, we started getting things like pacemakers. We started getting things like implants for, um, you know, oh, gee, I'm getting cataracts. Instead of going blind, we just replace your lens with a plastic lens. And um, Lasix. And when it happens, after it's accepted, nobody thinks about it anymore. Right. It's just normal. You know, oh, someone has a metal plate in their spine because blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah, sure. So just tell them when you go through the metal detectors at the airports. And I think that, um, and then there is sort of implant light, like glasses. Like, you know, we're all wearing around with this machine on our face and nobody thinks, oh, you have a machine on your face. It's yeah. just, of course you have glasses. You see better. Why wouldn't you? Shoes are an artificial device, but we've had them for so long that we forget that they're actually changing our relationship with the environment. A lot of examples of that. So I think that by the time this gradual move of technology, and there's, there's this idea that, that, um, um, that was sort of proposed uh, 51 years ago, uh, Moore's Law by Gordon Moore, which says that computers will continue to get faster, better, cheaper um, at an exponential rate. And so far, since, since he said that, you know, 1965, it has continued to be true. And that's why we go from the big clunky room-sized computers to the notebook computers to the phones in your yeah. pocket. And the next evolution of that is going to be wearables. And there are already, all the big companies are working on that. You know, anybody you look at, you know, Apple and Sony and Microsoft and Google, they're all trying to be the first to replace the brick in your pocket with the thing you wear on your face. And once you accept that, then what happens is, oh, okay, you and I are having a conversation. We have our wearable. We are kind of living in a Harry Potter world because stuff can just float in the air in front of us. But if we're kids who grew up with that generation, we don't think of that as magic. We think of that as reality. Are we going to accept that? I don't I, I don't, don't know whether that. you will, I but don't. I think kids will. Why not? Do you? Do you want that? Do you I, want to be having I a human to, conversation I, and then have, like, ha have our connection interrupted by, you know, no, your it won't be interrupted. Messages. If it's interrupted, then that's bad design. It shouldn't be interrupted. But your focus is interrupted. If I'm having a human connection with you, if we're talking about something important or just something funny, and you're saying something flies by that's not you real. You know, the irony of this is we're sitting in a room where there's all this media all around us. And because it's properly designed, it's not interfering with us. It's just there when we need it. So properly designed media does not interrupt your conversation. It supports your conversation. Does the cutting Resist edge keep moving? Sure. And also people never change. So mm -hmm. we, as a species with technology... Um, and technology is everything. Technology is books. Technology is clothing. Technology is air conditioning. We as a species with technology, buildings, you know, keep changing. But biologically, we're the same as we were 30,000 years ago. Every baby that's born has the same potential as they always have. It's just that because we have culture and technology is part of culture, the opportunities available to that human keep evolving from generation to generation. But we're still interested in all the same stuff. You know, love and, and death and hate and loyalty and fear and honor. Um, these aren't even things that exist in the physical world. They only exist inside our minds. And yet to us, that's reality because that's the way we think. And that will always be true, no matter what happens in worlds of Ready Player One or beyond. Do you think there's a limit to how much we will take on technology as... Well, my, my opinion is that, and you can see this for yourself, and how do we interact with books, with movies, with plays, with the internet, with Twitter? We theoretically could make any technology we wanted. 
we have that ability. But then when you throw that technology at, at hundreds of millions of people, say, what do they really do with it? I mean, we're not going to the movies every week and seeing science movies. We're going to the movies every week and seeing action adventure movies and romances. No matter what technology we make, we keep turning it toward what people are interested in. We never become about the technology because we don't change our brains. We take the technology and figure out how to use it as humans. <laughs> but we can change our brains. We're reaching the point where we could potentially I would say that directly I would say that Jack in. Well, actually, uh, all the people that I talk to about this, um, and I, I try to have conversations with neuroscientists and, and with uh, people who look at the physiology of the eye, and they say, you know, the brain starts with the optic nerve. And from here, that mm -hmm. retina, all going all the way back, there's a whole bunch of brain going on there. And the whole fantasy in the matrix that you do that, it's kind of not the way people's brains really work the most efficient thing to do is actually just to put light in the front. And then people are using all of this incredible power that they already have. So it makes a compelling visual fantasy, but it's probably not what people are gonna really do. Question for both of you. If the multiverse is, is possible, is it inevitable that we will find it or we will build it? Hmm. Well, let me, let me talk about the, the, the physics one because it's probably a faster answer. Uh, <laughs> It's possible to verify uh, certain types of multiverse. So the, the type that I mentioned, the, the, the bubble uh, universe that, that emerges out of this, this eternally inflating multiverse. If, these, if two bubbles happen to interact, to cross over, then they leave evidence on each other's skies. Um, and particularly in the form of uh, stains on the cosmic microwave background radiation. So this is a, a, a type of light that suffuses the entire universe. It was produced in the very early universe. Um, it's believed that two merging bubbles would leave sort of like coffee rings on the cosmic microwave background radiation. Hard to get those out. It, it, it might be impossible to get those out. And do it, we have those? They haven't been found yet. Do you think we live in a multiverse? I know we live in at least some types of multiverse. You know, so the type where, we, where if you travel far enough, you'll find infinite variations. Um, certainly, that, you know, that's, that's, it's hard to get around that conclusion. Uh, some of the more speculative ones, like the, the quantum mechanics, many worlds interpretation, mm -hmm. that's uh, very possible. Um, so the idea here is that uh, one interpretation of, of the bizarre results of quantum mechanical experiments is that uh, for every quantum mechanical interaction, reality splits along all possible results of that interaction. And so all possibilities are realized um, and, they, and, and as reality splits, it sort of can interact and, and the universes can communicate. But, but as they diverge, as they get too different, then they're lost to each other forever. But the idea is that since the Big Bang, every realization of this universe happened. And uh, it lives, for lack of a better word, somewhere else? Out there somewhere, um, but probably as inaccessible mm. uh, or more inaccessible than... Um, unless you watch Sliding Doors. Right. <laughs> Unless you watch Sliding Doors, yeah. M movies make it Gwyneth possible. Gwyneth Paltrow has experienced this, but not the rest Blonde of us. Blonde hair, brown hair, I remember that movie. Do you think we will, so, so in your mind, Ken, will we build the multiverse? Well, so my take on this might be a little unusual in that I really, and all of my research comes out of this, is that um, because somewhere over the course of the last several hundred thousand years, the human species evolved to be, um, to have this enormous facility with language. And apparently this is our big natural power up because it means we can uh, communicate like this in a way that is essentially a kind of mind reading. You know, I make sounds and you hear them and you know what's going on in my head and you start developing this theory of mind about this is what Ken's thinking. We're so used to this because it's the fundamental um, reality for us that we forget just how astonishing that is. Mm. And that means that as every child evolves and as we want to exercise our mind to become better at being human, 
we have this facility to create multiverses. So when you think about Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, or you think about any of the comedies of Shakespeare, um, these things never happened. But we know, you know, millions of people know all about Lizzie Bennet and Mr. Collins and Mr. Darcy. Right, and, it's shorthand. Yeah, yeah, right. And we understand them, and, and then people start doing they become alternate cultural versions reference of those. Points. Yeah, right, of course. So, so my take on this is that, yes, it is exciting, just as when we we're at the dawn of movies. You could do things with movies differently than you could do a play, or differently than you could do a novel. And it is exciting that we'll be able to go into these, you know, we'll put on the glasses, and now we're all sitting in um, a Martian <laughs> landscape, and maybe there's a robot floating, but it's going to be an extension of the kind of virtual world building that humans did long before computers. That they did around the campfire tens of thousands of years ago. Matt, many of our favorite multiverse movies, Narnia, Wizard of Oz, 12 Monkeys, Groundhog's Day, all have an element of time or time travel woven into them. So within, within the scientific possibility of, of alternate uh, dimensions, what is time and, and where does time fit in? Okay, time is as hard a subject as the multiverse and, and perhaps no better uh, accepted the, a, a, as a definition, what is time, is there a multiverse? Um, I, I would say that Einstein gave us perhaps our greatest insight into the nature of time. In his theories of special and general relativity, he uh, showed us that uh, our observation of the flow of time depends on uh, motion, depends on location within a gravitational field. Two, two different uh, scientists watching a clock. Um, uh, one who is stationary with respect to the clock sees the clock tick at a normal rate. Another one moving or accelerating to close to the speed of light sees the clock slowly slow down and almost but not quite freeze and sees the same thing also if, if uh, he or she is hanging out close to the event horizon of a, of a black hole. So time is relative, but the, to me the really amazing thing that, um, that comes out of uh, Einstein's formulation of relativity is that one thing is preserved. Okay, The flow of time, the length of the second can change, but causality is always preserved. So both uh, observers will always see one second happen after the other mm -hmm. in exactly the same sequence. Um, and in order to see the clock slow down and then reverse, tick backwards, you have to not just accelerate close to the speed of light, you have to break that cosmic speed limit, you have to travel faster than light. Um, and it, it can be shown mathematically that if you can travel faster than light, you can actually time travel. Um, and it, it turns out that traveling faster than the speed of light is also kind of what you need to do in order to visit uh, other universes. Certainly in terms of our expanding universes where those other bubbled universes are actually racing away from us at faster than the speed of light. You need to be able to both travel faster than the speed of light to, to get there and that same technology would let you travel in time. And mm. so it seems like the, the universe conspires to stop us doing either mm. with this one limit, um, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> if Elon Musk is right and, and our reality is a mechanical construct created for the entertainment of some superior race, how do you explain the boring bits? And, and I mean that as a serious question because, for example, in the procedurally generated world of No Man's Sky, those 18 quintillion planets get boring really fast. So question for both of you, in an infinite world, no matter how it's constructed, is boredom or nothingness just part of the package? I think boredom is something that is an entirely human construct. We need to be stimulated. We, you know, if obviously if you're not being stimulated, you're not living your life. You're, we only live so long. You know, it's like that old joke of where is time and how come there isn't enough of it, <laughs> you know? And so I think that what, first of all, I think the metaphysical idea that he raises, that Musk raises, that this is all for the entertainment of some superior being is, I don't think about those things. I think they're way above my pay grade. Um, I actually- You just don't think about them? You, you don't reject that idea? Um, well, I think it's what he said. 
there's like all these possible alternate universes and it's interesting to think about them mathematically. Um, you can talk about anything. You can talk about all of those different versions of Shakespeare that are somewhere out there in the digits of that number. It's just not interesting to me because it's not something that will, I can connect with that I will ever be able to connect with. I can even show that I will never be able to connect with it. You can't get there from here. I'm going to agree with this, um, particularly with regards to uh, Musk's statement. Um, he was actually referring, I think he was referring to a thing called an ancestor simulation. The yes. idea being what that... what is that? So, so the hypothesis is that some vastly advanced future us and given the exponential rate of Moore's law, maybe not even that vastly advanced, it will be possible to simulate the entire experience of one of your ancestors, you know, entire mental life, you know, from, from birth mm -hmm. to death. Okay, and, and the idea being that as long as some advanced civilization simulates billions of ancestors, okay, so, so everything that goes on in here, um, then it's more likely numerically that we're just one of those simulations as opposed to the original ancestors that are then later simulated. Mm -hmm. So, so what the problem- is, What is the matrix? Yeah, exactly. It's just, <laughs> and, and so presumably these are either scientists wanting to understand their ancestors or, I mean, the ultimate quite boring reality TV show, um, my problem with this is, is also, I think, related to your problem, is that it's such a thoroughly untestable hypothesis because part of the hypothesis is that, you know, the, the people running the simulation can rewind and edit it at any time. You know, for example, if we figure out that it's a simulation, they can rewind that bit and wipe over it. Mm -hmm. And so there's nothing, there's no test we could do mm. that can't be... Um, manipulated with with perfect flexibility by the simulators and so I think we need to proceed assuming that it's not the case. <laughs> you know there's a line from Douglas Adams a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy where he says there is a theory that if humanity ever figured out the universe something even more bizarre and improbable would immediately um, be swapped in. Right. Um, there is another theory that this has already happened. Well quantum mechanics is... Yeah. <laughs> so you know, and that's we only get we only get to experience the reality we experience, and all the rest is just talk because we can't get there. It's interesting how in conversations about this kind of stuff, mm -hmm. how often it helps to reference a movie like The Matrix mm -hmm. or Hitchhiker's Guide sure. to the Galaxy because it's and that stuff is science fiction yeah. that may not maybe may not be so fictional, but it's it's the way our culture has to even ap approach these huge questions is well, through our I, movies and our, and our science fiction and some mm -hmm. of our video games, Well, there's right? a sort of a framing thing going on here in the sense that I think that what's exciting about being human is not that we will literally visit alternate realities. It's that we have these minds that can already do that and that I can talk about Captain Kirk and Vulcans and Klingons. And they're real and to us in And a way. everybody gets it. Yeah. And that's fantastic about us. We can collectively go anywhere together that our minds can conceive. And those are vastly larger spaces than what we could mechanically build. Right. And we can also, we cannot actually travel through time to alternate realities just in one direction, which is forward. And, you know, it's quite nice that we actually get to decide what that reality is going to be mm -hmm. moving forward. So, you know, the, the, the tempting escapism of wanting to step through a closet to Narnia yeah. or, or to a Star Trek universe. Ma Narnia, not so much, but you know, we can make the Star Trek universe. We just have to you know, work and wait. But also, I think a very fundamental difference between Narnia and No Man's Sky is that we all want to get to the back of that wardrobe because we know that's not boring. Whereas if you just set up a procedural system, you say, oh, you guys figure it out. It's like, okay, so here's a paint set, go ahead and do something. That No Man's Sky is basically a paint set. It's like you then still have to do all of the work of doing the storytelling. Whereas in Narnia, I think you're being pulled in and yeah. Tolkien does the same thing that C.S. Lewis does, just pulls you right in. And we're not bored because we're being taken on a guided journey by someone who understands us. I have to, I have to thank you in a way because I've, uh, there's something to me about the, the, maybe the inevitability of, of a virtual reality world 
that is scares me and seems almost sinister. And uh, but I am, I mean, I went to grad school to study books, mm. and when you when you sort of show how analogous they are, that that books are also a virtual reality and, yeah. and transportative. Um, it makes it, I, I relate to that. And you could actually argue that books are a more powerful virtual reality than we could ever do with modern technology. If you look at Gogol's short story, The Nose, you know, a nose impersonates an army officer and everybody's walking around Moscow and he's being an army officer and, and, and everyone is like, oh, and then the guy has to keep finding his nose, but everyone in the world thinks it's, it's an army officer because he's wearing a uniform. You can't even make a movie out of that. There's no way to visualize that. So Gogol writes this story, we all read it, it makes perfect sense to us, and there isn't even any picture of it. That's how powerful the human imagination is. And my mother says that, because she grew up as a little girl listening to the radio. Mm. She, I remember she once said to me, she said, the best special effects I ever saw were on the radio. <laughs> That's wonderful. And yeah. it's just so to the point. No, it, it makes me say, and so now I will think about virtual reality mm -hmm. um, as, as the ultimate 3D pop-up book. Right? Yeah, I think that's a good way to think about it. <laughs> thank you both. That's all we have time for in this no, universe. Thank you very much. In this <laughs> universe. Um, <laughs> it's another <laughs> universe where we're just going on and on. It goes on, on and on. There's not, there's not even a director's cut. It just goes on. <laughs> Don't forget to check out the 360 videos and VR downloads on our Science Goes to the Movies Facebook page. And if you want to watch past episodes, check us out at www.cuny.tv under the Science tab.